from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Peggy Pearlstein. I'm head of the Hebraic section here in the African and Middle Eastern Division of the Library of Congress. Welcome to today's program with Professor Sarah Boonin Benor, who will speak, be speaking about her new book, uh, Becoming From and uh, Languages. Well, this is certainly the place for languages. The Library of Congress has more than 400 languages in its collection. And here in the African Middle Eastern Division, we do collection development and reference for more than 77 countries, from the tip of Africa all the way up to the Caucasus. Um, if you are interested in materials in Arabic, Persian, Turkish, Armenian, Georgian, this is the place to come. As for the Hebraic section, um, which is actually celebrating its 100th anniversary. Uh, it uh, got its first collection of Hebrew books in 1912, 10,000 rare Hebrew books. If you're interested in materials in Hebrew, Yiddish, Ladino, Judeo Tat, uh, this is the place to come as well. So, in addition to developing the collection and doing reference work, uh, the division is also actively involved in programs, in conferences, and in exhibits. And in fact, we just completed an exhibit, uh, Words Like Sapphires, 100 Years of Hebraica at the Library of Congress, 1912 to 2012, and that's available online from the library's home page. And now I would like to introduce Sharon Horowitz, our senior reference librarian in the Hebraic section. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the Hebraic section, uh, welcome to the African and Middle Eastern Reading Room. Our speaker today, as you heard, is Sarah Boonin Ben Or, Associate Professor of Contemporary Jewish Studies at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, Los Angeles campus. Uh, Sarah earned a BA in Comparative Literature and Linguistics from Columbia University and her Master's and PhD in Linguistics from Stanford. She's a uh, sociolinguist who has focused on the spoken language of American Jews. In her book, Becoming From, How Newcomers Learn the Language and Culture of Orthodox Judaism, Professor Ben Orr describes how newly Orthodox Jews have to adopt not only the laws and customs of the Orthodox or From community, but also their speech patterns. As an aside, From is a Yiddish-derived adjective denoting one who practices an Orthodox Jewish religious lifestyle. Uh, with her use of from in the title, Professor Ben Orr gives the reader a sense of the insider nature of language in Orthodox communities. Her book emerged out of a year long study of an Orthodox community in Philadelphia. Before I turn the podium over to Professor Ben Orr, let me mention that this event is being videotaped for subsequent broadcasting. There will be a formal question and answer period after the lecture at which the audience is encouraged to ask questions and offer comments. But please be advised that your voice and image may be recorded and later broadcast as part of this event. By participating in the Q&A period, you are consenting to the library's possible reproduction and transmission of your remarks. And now, please join me in welcoming Professor Sarah Boonin Ben Or. Hi, thank you so much for coming today. I'm really honored to be here. Um, when I give talks like these, it's rare that I know even one or two people on, in the audience, but today I have a lot of friends and relatives given that I grew up in Rockville, Maryland. So thank you all for being here today. Can you all see the screens? Okay. This is Matt, but you might know him as Matis Yahoo. The 
Hasidic reggae superstar who now looks a little more like this. But I'm going to talk about his transition from non-Orthodox to black hat Orthodox. And in my talk today, I'm going to be using two terms that are local to the communities where I did my research. BTs, meaning Bale Tshuva, or those who return, and FFBs, meaning those who are from or religious from birth, people who grew up in the Orthodox community. So my question is, how do BTs learn Orthodox language and culture? And to answer this question, as Sharon said, I spent a year doing research in an Orthodox community in Philadelphia. And out there in the exhibit about the Americas, um, they mentioned eth ethnography as a method that the conquerors used to learn about the native cultures, um, listening to the way that people speak and, and learning about their religion. And that's exactly what I did in this community with slightly different motives. Um, and I did this research about a decade ago. <clears throat> I had two main field sites. One was an, an outreach center, and these are all pseudonyms that I use, that I refer to as Nair Tamid. And the other one was an Orthodox neighborhood called Milldale, about a 45 minute drive away from that outreach center. Now within Judaism, we talk about a continuum of religiosity with the most secular Jews on one side and the most Haredi or black hat or ultra-Orthodox Jews on the other side. And in the middle we have Reform, Conservative, and Modern Orthodox. The community where I did my research is a non-Hasidic black hat community. Um, they don't use the term yeshivish to refer to themselves, but that is a term that some might use, yeshivish modern community. And this is in contrast to Hasidic Jewish communities, which have also been the subject of some research in terms of language and culture. And you might be wondering where I fall on this continuum, somewhere in the middle, uh, kind of conservative-ish. Uh, okay, so to give you a little bit of background about Orthodox Jews, as you know, they adhere strictly to Jewish law. They maintain some degree of social separation different in different communities, and I'm focusing here on the black hat Orthodox community, which has a little bit more social separation. And they have a number of cultural practices that distinguish them from non-Orthodox Jews. Distinctive ways of dressing, distinctive foods that they eat, especially influenced by Eastern European cuisines, distinctive home decor, including kind of like this room here, bookshelves filled with Judaica. Uh, and also a centerpiece of the home decor is a very large dining room table, often covered with a white tablecloth cloth and a plastic covering over it. Distinctive music, um, all sort of influenced by 80s pop music with a lot of electric keyboards. Distinctive names, a lot of names from Hebrew and Yiddish. And distinctive language. Now, a majority of American Orthodox Jews are descendants of Yiddish speakers. The community where I did my research, however, Yiddish is not spoken. Most of the people in this community are native English speakers. They also tend to be proficient in Hebrew for prayer and study. And the men in the community also study Aramaic rabbinic texts. Now, their English is distinct, and this is what I'm going to be focusing on today. They're English is filled with words from Hebrew and Aramaic and Yiddish, filled with Ashkenazi pronunciations of Hebrew words and, and Ashkenazi forms of Hebrew words, distinct English pronunciation, like saying candle instead of candle, and other distinctive vowels and consonants, uh, and a number of grammatical influences from Yiddish, like saying staying by them instead of staying at their house, distinctive intonation, if you've heard it, you know what I'm talking about. And a number of other features. Now I'm going to give you a quote um, and you'll see some of these distinctive features here. This is a quote that a rabbi uh, said while he was giving a lecture in preparation for Passover. The mitzvah of the matzah by the seder should be, we're machmir, it's a chumrah to have shmura mishasa ktsira, that the wheat that is harvested for Pesach should be already watched from the time of the harvest. 
So you see we had the, the underlined words are words from Hebrew. And notice they're pronounced in the Ashkenazi way, the Eastern European way, as opposed to the Israeli way. And there are, and the bold features, the by we mentioned, and already is also an influence from Yiddish grammar. Notice that in the wheat that is harvested, the T is released. Now this is not just a Jewish thing. People of all different backgrounds do this, but it sounds particularly precise and learned. And I found that, Orthodox, that in Orthodox communities, especially men, release their T's at a much higher rate. Here's another quote. This is from an interview with an Orthodox woman named Mrs. Adler, pseudonyms. Um, in another community, people might, if they have a different sort of Yiddish kite, so they might not daven in the same shul. They might send their kids to different yeshivas. So again, we have a number, of this, in this case, mostly Yiddish words. And we also have this so, which is an influence from Israeli Hebrew. And interestingly, even people who haven't spent time in Israel pick up this so, as well as the click. Now, there's two different kinds of clicks. In Israel, there's the no click. If you say, can I get that for five shekels? That means no. And it's done with a head tilt and a lip rounding. But this is a different kind of click. It's a hesitation click. And it just means I'm rethinking what I'm saying or I'm... Uh, or it sometimes expresses slightly negative affect. So this is to give you some examples of the kinds of quotes that people use. And when they use quotes like these, they refer to this kind of language as from speak or yeshivish. I'm the only uh, person, or scholars are the only ones who use terms like Orthodox Jewish English. Um, but there's actually a dictionary called Frumspeak, the first dictionary of yeshivish. And it includes not only a dictionary of words from Hebrew, Yiddish, and Aramaic that are used within English, but also translations of things into yeshivish, like the Gettysburg Address. So given all of these distinctive orthodox cultural practices, the question is to what extent do BTs adopt them? Now, to help me answer that, I turn to a framework from post-colonial studies known as borderlands, where this notion that when a, an indigenous people is in a place and a colonial power comes in and brings their culture, the indigenous people are changed, and they can no longer go back to the culture that they had before, and they do not completely adapt the culture that has been brought in to them. Now, the situation with Balei Tshuva is much different because they are willingly adopting this culture, but the situation is kind of similar in that they have started out as non-Orthodox Jews, but they can never become FFB. No matter how long they are in a community, even if they can somewhat pass as FFB, people still tend to know, for the most part, that they are BT. So they are somewhere in the middle, in this BT borderland. So how do they navigate this BT borderland? I found two strategies. The first is hyper-accommodation. This is a term from social psychology and sociolinguistics. It refers to how people, when they're trying to adopt a new way of speaking, they sometimes go beyond the norm that people who are already part of the community have. So in this case, we see that BTs take on orthodox practices to an even greater extent than FFBs. So for example, when I told one FFB girl about my research project, that I'm interested in how Balei Tshuva learn Orthodox language and culture. She said, you mean they learn it and then they go way beyond other people making us feel like we're not religious? There are also a number of jokes about this hyper accommodation. Every culture has at least seven light bulb jokes, right? So in this case, um, there's how many BTs does it take to screw in a light bulb? You mean you can do that? This sense that they're afraid that they will make a mistake when they're doing something, right? We also have um, the joke about the, the BT couple and they've moved into a new home and gotten their whole kitchen set up and the woman accidentally uses a flaschic spoon, a spoon that's supposed to be for meat products for her ice cream. And he says, oh, that's it, pack our things, we're moving. So this sense that they, they go uh, overboard, right? 
Also, in terms of names, Elisheva and Eliyahu are common names in Orthodox communities, but the joke is that BTs name their children Kelisheva and Keliahu or Kelikaku, and I'll explain this because there is a taboo against using the name of God, one of which is El, um, and if, um, if you say Kale instead of El, then it, it gets over that taboo. But this is not generally used in names except among people who aren't familiar with the community. And you have the same, what do BTs drink? Ginger kale, right? Now I actually made ginger kale the other day and it was really good, I highly recommend it. Kale, you know, ginger flavored kale, okay. <laughs> so um, one BT woman told me that that she's planning to, when she gets married, to wear her hair, to wear a wig, that is a, a shaitel, which is common because um, Orthodox women who are married are expected to cover their hair. And she's gonna do that, but she's also gonna wear a hat on top. So this is known as double covering. She said, I had days when I was not sneeze modest. So for me, I feel like the way to do tshuva on that, to repent, is that I'm gonna double cover. So it's a sense that it's not, uh, necessarily an unintentional hyper accommodation. Sometimes they are aware that they are doing things more than the people who um, are already part of their community. And there's also a common discussion about this in the community that in their attempt to make sure they're saying things properly, they end up making more of a botch of it. There are people who try too hard. Every other word is some kind of Hebrew or Yiddish expression. And one word that is particularly commonly discussed in the community is the word mamish. It's a Hebrew and Yiddish origin word that means really, and there is the sense that Balei Tshuva say mamish all the time. Uh, same with Baruch Hashem. For example, an FFB woman told me this. Sometimes a BT wants to sound from, so they throw in from expressions. BTs do it more because they're trying to make up for lost time and because they're trying to fit in. That's a mark of being from. They don't want to be looked down upon. They pepper their language with Baruch Hashem more. I use them too, but not every third word. <laughs> An example of hyper accommodation is Rivka Bracha. She was born as Rebecca, but when she became from, she changed her name to Rivka, and then about a year later to Rivka Bracha. Um, there's, a, it's pretty common in Orthodox communities for people to use two different names. In fact, one BT comedian told me a joke um, mimicking or um, imitating Lenny Bruce a bit. He said, Yaakov, Dov, Tzvi, not from. Yaakov, Tzvi, from. Um, so that's the case with Rivka Bracha. She felt that to uh, show her new attachment to orthodoxy, she preferred to use two names. Um, and Bracha wasn't given to her at birth, so she picked up that, uh, she, she chose that one herself. Now, Rivka Bracha uses a lot of distinctive language. She uses a lot of Hebrew and Yiddish words. She uses clicks. She uses a lot of T-release. Her intonation sounds very distinctive. Um, if you're going to the store, get me some milk, that kind of thing. And she uses a lot of Yiddish grammatical influences, including she once said, this is not what to record, uh, meaning this is not something to record. I was a little sad that she said that because I had to turn off the tape recorder, but at least I got that one on tape. Um, and she also was so successful in her acquisition of this language that an FFB woman cast her as the Yiddish Bubby from Borough Park uh, in the women's Purim spiel. And she was very proud of this. She felt that this was a sign that she had successfully integrated and acculturated. She's also aware that her language is not grammatically correct in standard English. She says, I don't speak the good king's English anymore. I speak this Yinglish, yeshivish stuff, which is fine by me. So now, that's hyper-accommodation. In addition, we have another strategy, kind of opposite strategy, known as, which I refer to as deliberate distinctiveness. Matis Yahu is a good example of this. You see here in his frum phase, how he dressed in a frum way. You have the white shirt, the dark jacket, the black velvet kippah, the long beard, and the wire-rimmed glasses, 
and the tzitzis, the fringe, the ritual fringe is hanging out, right? But notice it's all slightly different. So his shirt's not tucked in, his um, tzitzis are kind of lopsided, and his body position is one that you would not normally see in Orthodox communities, kind of looks Christological, but that's another story. Okay, and this is not just Matis Yahu. We also have other um, rappers and singers who are Balei Tshuva and who do similar things with their appearance. We also have people who maintain their hobbies from before they became from. It's not very common in Orthodox communities to go snowboarding, although some people who grew up Orthodox do. Um, but in, in this case, we see a woman in her long skirt and her hat going snowboarding. Also, dogs are not very common in Orthodox communities. Now, I'm not talking about modern Orthodox communities. I'm talking about black hat Orthodox communities. Um, but here we see um, a woman who is a, bal a balas chuva, and she keeps her dog. Um, now, I did meet another woman uh, in the Orthodox community where I did my research who had a dog named Shana. So using a Yiddish name for a pet is kind of a way of combining uh, things, combining practices from the different communities. And we have um, Balei Tshuva who maintain their body piercings. Some of them let them close up. Um, especially after a few years in the community, but others prefer to maintain them to show that they're not only Orthodox, but they're also Balei Tshuva. So we also get other unique combinations like a uh, man who wears a black hat with trendy sunglasses, or um, I was once at someone's house and she made gefilte fish and one of the guests said, this is so good, what makes it so good? And she said, curry and turmeric. And I had never before heard those words in that Orthodox community because international cuisine is not very common, at least at the time when I was doing my research, was not very common in black hat Orthodox communities. Since then it has changed a bit and international cuisine has uh, made its way into some of the communities including the one where I did my research. We also see combinations in language where people will use distinctive Orthodox language combined with mild profanity and slang. For example, Jacob is a Baal Tshuva. He's been Orthodox for several years, and he uses many, many loan words from Hebrew and Yiddish, gr Yiddish grammatical influences like, I told over a story, that phrasal verb from Yiddish. And he uses final devoicing like going instead of going. And he also uses mild profanity, like this really sucks, or someone screwed up the air conditioner, that kind of thing. <clears throat> now sometimes this deliberate distinctiveness is based on ideology. Ideology that the way that Orthodox Jews speak English is incorrect and therefore I'm not going to say staying by them. I heard one woman say that and then a few minutes later I heard her on the phone with an FFB woman saying, so are you going to be staying by us for Shabbos? And so even if people have these ideologies, they don't necessarily maintain them in practice. And this is also sometimes based on concerns with authenticity concerns that they will sound inauthentic if they use things that they didn't grow up with. So for example, um, Joseph told me that he doesn't say the oi sound in, in words like toira. Um, you can say toira or torah or torah. I say torah. Most Orthodox Jews in the community where I did my research say torah. And in other Orthodox communities that are to the right of that continuum say toira. Um, now, he said that he doesn't like to say Torah. He says people who say Torah are either Balei Tshuva, who are really trying hard to look really yeshivish, or FFBs who have a Hasidish, Hasidic, or very religious upbringing. Now, a good example of deliberate distinctiveness is Samuel. He uses no distinctive grammatical features from Yiddish, no clinks, clicks, no distinctive intonation. He uses some Hebrew words, but many of the words that he uses from Hebrew have mistakes. So for example, he'll say something like, that was a very chesed thing to do, whereas chesed is normally a noun rather than an adjective, or saying bal tshuva instead of bal tshuva. So we've seen these two different strategies for navigating the BT borderlands, hyper accommodation and deliberate distinctiveness. But sometimes we see them in progression. And this is a progression that I refer to as the bungee effect. 
So a bungee jumper, how many of you have ever gone bungee jumping? Okay, okay. you haven't. My daughter, Eliza, has not gone bungee jumping, but um, my brother, Aaron, has. Um, and so bungee jumping involves jumping off of a very high place, and you get to the bottom of the rope, and then you bounce back up, right? So it's the same in terms of religious and cultural immersion. You jump off the deep end at the beginning, and then you gradually moderate your cultural practices and, and change them a bit. So an example of this is Levy. Levy told me that, and now at, at the time when I interviewed him, he was wearing um, striped shirts and not just white shirts anymore, and he still wore a black hat, but only on Shabbos. So he told me about this transition that he went through. Actually, can I get a volunteer to read this? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, come on. My sister Miriam. Initially, you're constantly trying to prove yourself, and then eventually you get to a point where you know I'm comfortable with my knowledge and what I know how to do, and I'm not fooling anybody but myself, and you come to grips with who you are. There's a lot of sort of going out and finding where you feel comfortable. So you really have to go beyond it and then slip back to it. So that's the difficult part of the transition. Thanks, just to rest my voice a bit. Matis Yahu was an example of this kind of bungee effect. That he started out getting interested in his Judaism and he kind of went off the deep end in terms of getting involved in all of the cultural practices he could find. And then he gradually uh, tempered that and took off his, and um, at this point, could be an example of the bungee effect. More recently, he has taken off the kippah and um, is no longer identified as orthodox. Uh, but in this case, he could have been an example of the bungee effect. And here's a song that illustrates a lot of these things that we've been talking about. It's called BT Blues by Rabbi Moshe Shur. About Moshe a man Shur. named Joe. He did some tshuva, or at least he thought so. But after 15 years, eight whole months, and just about a week, they still call him about Chuba Freak. Oh, Lord, don't make me into a bane on me. All my friends are tzidikim. It's so hard on me, cause I work on myself. But I'm still a bit confused. Yes, I got me a case of them about Chuba Blues. Joe went off to a symptom and took a glance. They were all dancing the lush and horror. And it didn't have a chance. There were a hundred percent authentic superglot FFBs, a different kind of breed than a real IPT. Oh Lord, don't make me into a bane on me. All my friends are tzaddikim. It's so hard on me, cause I work on myself, and I'm still a bit confused. Guess I got me a case of them. Balchuba Blues. Joe went down to shul. To learn how to dobbin, he shuckled so hard, his head was a bobbin. They all stared at him, not knowing what to say. You're much too quiet for us. You're not talking or making a fuss. You just can't do what you wanna. You got way too much cavana. Joe went out on the shittah, on the balas chuvas freakus, even ironed his titsis. He knew he had a weakness, but when he saw her standing there, her chumash and Birkenstocks, he knew she was a zivug, another one of the flock. Oh Lord, don't make okay, me Okay, the liberate distinctiveness there, the combination, like the chumash, the Bible, it's and the Birkenstocks, which are not commonly worn among FFBs. But I'm still a bit confused. Guess I got me a case of them. About you the blues. Now Joe has a family, a mortgage, and a car. He's come a long way, though he hasn't gone too far. But when his kids show him the pictures of them, good old days, he says, it really doesn't look like me. It must be my old friend's fee. I, I could have never ever looked like that. I'm not wearing my Stetson hat.
Now they call our Joe Yussel from a bit. He even talks during Abner and hangs out at the Schwitz. He trimmed his beard to pay us and only learns once a week. He's become one of them, a real Hebra man. He's now an FFT from from Chuba, you see. About his past he will not speak, cause he never lets on that he ever once was a Bachuba freak. Lord, don't make me into a Benoni. All my friends are Tzadikim. It's so hard on me, cause I work on myself. But I'm still a bit confused. Guess I got me a case of them. Bob Chuba Blue. Okay, I'd like to thank Rabbi Shur for writing a song that so beautifully illustrates a lot of the things that I've been talking about. Okay. Um, now, one of the things I want to point out is the Benoni. Um, now, that's a rabbinic concept. Um, you're not a tzaddik or a rasha. You're not a righteous person or a bad person, but you're some, somewhere in the middle. Um, but I think this really also illustrates this notion of borderlands, of, of being in an in-between state. Um, and you notice in that song not only the hyper-accommodation and the deliberate distinctiveness and the bungee effect, but also the use of a lot of Hebrew and Yiddish words within the English, right? Um, and even the, the type of music um, is not common among Orthodox Jews. The album that it's on, most of the other songs sound a lot like Orthodox American pop music. Um, this one is kind of a bluegrass style, which is similar to Matis Yahu using reggae music. It's a way of combining a practice that's not common in the Orthodox community with Orthodox content. So now, the question arises, how do BTs learn orthodox linguistic features? And I want to be sure to leave enough time for questions, so I'm going to focus on a particular case of language learning, and that is weekly study sessions between Andrew and Avram. Andrew is, in this case, a recent BT, and Avram is an FFB, and they study Talmud together every week, and in this case, I. I, and I recorded them over a number of sessions. In this case, I heard them talking about the words mekel and machmir. Mekel means lenient, and machmir means stringent. So Avram says, mekel and machmir, you know what I mean? I'm sure you've heard those terms before, like, oh, he's mekel. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure, I just never knew what it meant. Exactly, because no one, machmir I knew, but yeah, but they always say that, and you never know what it means, and you're always too embarrassed to ask, and you're always expected like you know, you know, it's kind of rough. So this is kind of unusual in that this is a case of direct language instruction, where the FFB is aware that this BT is going to be spending time in yeshiva and wants him to feel comfortable, and so he socializes him to use certain words. And that was words that appear in the Talmudic text, um, but the, we also see this with a Yiddish word that does not appear in the Talmudic text, the Yiddish word schwer, meaning difficult. So they encounter a difficult passage, and Avram says, as they say in the yeshiva, it's schwer, it's difficult, it's hard for me. Andrew laughs a little, because Andrew was kind of, Avram was saying it in a funny way. And then Avram says, no, I'm serious, I hear that all the time. So then Andrew says, schwer, and he starts to write it down. So he's aware that he should be learning these words, and he makes efforts to learn them. A little later, um, Andrew encounters the word pshita, meaning simple, which he had recently learned. And Andrew says pshita, and he looks back at his notes where he wrote down shver, and he says, it's not shaver. And Avram says, it's not shver, it's not shver. Good call, you know how to use that word. You see how we're using these words? I want you to use shver whenever you speak to anyone now. You're just walking on the street, and Andrew smiles and says, that's going to be very shver to do. Okay, so... Based on exchanges like this, I came up with a number of stages in the acquisition of loan words. Now, these stages are a bit different from child language acquisition because you have things like what we just saw where they mark something as not belonging to them. Often when children learn new words, they'll just use them in their speech, sometimes wrong, but they'll use them in an unmarked way. So in this case, 
the, now these stages are optional and not everybody goes through all of these stages. So first, the novice hears the word without noticing it or understanding it. Then they hear it in a context that facilitates understanding or remembering it. Then they either ask about it or look it up. Sometimes they skip that stage altogether and just figure it out from context. Then they might use it with a mistake, they might use it in a marked way, and the final stage is using it seriously, correctly, and with full authority. So in my recordings, I managed to capture the acquisition of the word chazer. Uh, over the course of four months, Andrew is socialized to use this word. Now this is not chazer like pig, different chazer. It means to repeat or summarize part of a text. So in November, I heard Andrew do uh, stage one where Avram used the word chazer a few times, but Andrew made no indication that he noticed it or understood it. Stage two, he hears it in a context that facilitates understanding or remembering it. Um, that same day, Avram explained the word by telling a story about his chavrusa, his study partner, who thought that learning Gemara and not chazering it is like planting a field and not cultivating it. So that's a way that would help him remember it. Stages three and four of the next week, um, the novice asks about the word or looks it up and then uses it with a mistake. So in this case, as Andrew is about to repeat the text to chazer it, he says, now what's, the, what's this called when we uh, sort of summarize what we did? It's ka and Avram tells him chazer. So he tries to say a chazer, but with a mistake, and he's also asking about it. Um, and then that same day, he uses it in a marked way. When Avram asks Andrew to go through what they just learned, Andrew, sa Andrew says, you want me to chazer it, huh? So that pause, the rise in his tone, the smile, indicates that he doesn't quite feel full ownership over that word yet. So that's in December. In February, he's still using it in a slightly marked way because Avram says, want to chazer? And Andrew says, let's chazer, right? So in this, he could have just said, sure, right? But he repeats the word because he is, doesn't quite feel full ownership over, yet, over it yet and he's still kind of playing with it, right? And then a month later, we see uh, stage six, that he uses it with full authority without a smile or other marking. <coughs> so that's just one example of how uh, the stages that people go through in learning new ways of speaking. Now, sometimes it's based on these kind of explicit interactions of socio, <coughs> inter <coughs> excuse me, interactions of uh, sociolinguistic social socialization. Um, but other times it happens um, in a less explicit way and often people just kind of pick up the words on their own. Now, as novices gain increased access to the sociolinguistic repertoire of orthodoxy, they are actively engaged in learning to make it their own or avoiding elements of it. We see that community veterans and other novices help them in this process through interactions of, of language socialization. And we see that BTs make creative use of the orthodox cultural repertoire to navigate the BT borderlands, to present themselves not only as orthodox, but also as BT. And um, you can see other elements of this process of acquisition and socialization in my book that I believe is on sale back there. And um, the, the talk that I did today goes through about a quarter of the book and other, other aspects of the book are discussing the continuum between modern orthodox and black hat orthodoxy and how this relates to cultural practices, especially language. Um, it also talks about how the findings are related to other people who learn new ways of speaking as adults. 
Um, like for example, when people become parents, they have to learn the new ways of speaking about their children. Or when people become doctors or lawyers or car repair people or cosmetologists, they have to learn the jargon of their profession. And a lot of the process of language learning happens through similar interactions and through gradually gaining increased access to various elements of the community. So I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for your presentation, Professor. I really enjoyed it immensely. I just had a question. Uh, you mentioned the exhibit out here in terms of the technology and where these people came from. So who are they? Were they reform? Were they conservative? Were they reconstructionists? Were they no affiliation? Were they converts? Just anecdotally, I know at least uh, children of three reform families and their children became Orthodox, including the former head of the Union for Reform Judaism, Rabbi Daffy, whose daughter became Orthodox. Uh, so could you please more explain a little bit more about the origin, where they came from? Yes, the question is, can I explain about the origin of these Balei Tshuva? Did they grow up secular, reform, conservative? Con are they converts? And the answer is yes, all of the above. In the community where I did my research, I found people who um, had grown up completely secular Jews with no Jewish education. Um, and I found uh, people who grew up conservadox. Um, and there was some question there, should we consider them Balei Tshuva or not? Um, and um, I, I, did, I made my distinction, are they Balei Tshuva or not, for my quantitative analysis, which is also in the book, based on whether they grew up Orthodox or not, and um, whether, sorry, whether they grew up in a, an Orthodox community or not. So if somebody grew up um, as the only Orthodox um, Jew in their family, maybe they observed, well, actually, I didn't have anyone like that, but um, I also found a number of people who grew up very religious reform and conservative Jews. That is, they, were, they observed some of the holidays and um, they weren't as strict in their observance of Shabbat, but they did something for Shabbat every week. But they didn't grow up in an Orthodox community. They didn't grow up using the language and hearing the language around them. Now, the question of converts is an interesting one. Um, I thought about maybe including converts in a separate category, um, but there were so few of them. Um, and I also found that it was hard to distinguish between converts and people who grew up Jewish, um, but not halachically Jewish. So that is, if someone grows up with a Jewish father and not a Jewish mother, but they grow up practicing Judaism, the reform movement considers them to be Jewish, but um, traditional Judaism does not. And so they are officially converts. Um, but I also found, so I had some converts like that in my study. I had some completely secular Jews with much less Jewish education than them. So we can't just say that converts have to learn a lot more than Jews because in some cases they have to learn less than some other Jews. Other questions? Yes. yes uh, do you uh, notice any differences in, um, in uh, multitude of practices between how they practice here versus how they practice, let's say, in Israel? Do you notice any differences? The question is, are there differences between how Balei Tshuva practice Judaism here, in, meaning in America, and versus in Israel? Yes, um, Israel is a completely Jewish um, milieu, so they are uh, the, the Orthodox Jews who, Balei Tshuva who live in Israel, um, have are completely surrounded by other people who are like them in terms of um, observance. And in America, they're not necessarily. They, they might still live among non-Orthodox Jews, among non-Jews. Um, even when they move to an Orthodox neighborhood, it's not a completely Orthodox neighborhood, with some exceptions. Um, there are also differences in terms of the language. Because in Israel, they speak Hebrew. Um, there are also communities where Yiddish is the primary language and where English, Jewish English, is the primary language. Um, in America, though, there are differences in different areas. And um, that's, this is one of the dimensions that I discuss in terms of not just the orthodox continuum, modern orthodox to black hat, but there are also other continua. 
whether um, how densely orthodox their community is where they live um, and how, where they are in relation to New York. Um, New York is a center of orthodox life in the U.S. and those who live in New York and especially in densely orthodox parts of New York have a very different experience transitioning to orthodoxy than elsewhere. I purposely did my research outside of New York because I wanted a smaller community that would be a bit more manageable. Um, and the community where I did my research sees itself in opposition to New York. You know, they, they, and people who are from New York discuss others as out of town. Um, and even people who are f not from New York themselves to refer to themselves as out of town. And some people have told me, well, what you found would be very different in different places. Absolutely. In fact, in a very small community, um, like in a... Um, I don't want to give specific examples, but maybe somewhere in the middle of the country, um, it would be very different um, than in a community that has a lot of Orthodox Jews already. In a very small com Orthodox community, it's a little different. Yes? Okay. Okay. So, wait. What was the first question again? <laughs> what was the first question again? Oh, right, okay. So the first question is about the um, distinction between the superficial cultural practices versus the, the um, deeper um, religious observance, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and to answer that, there's an interesting concept in, in Judaism of na'asev and ishma. We, um, we will do and we will hear. That is, first we will do things and then we will understand them. Um, and and that is um, something that I heard from some Orthodox Jews that they didn't quite understand why they should be dressing this way or why they should be using these Yiddish words and Hebrew words, but they do it to fit into the community and then eventually they understand and eventually the, the, the internal element of it follows. Um, now that's not the case with the uh, uh, religious observance. They're expected to, um, they're not considered to be Orthodox Jews unless they observe Shabbos, unless they observe um, certain other halachic um, rules and, and restrictions, right? Um, but in the case of cultural practices, certainly there are people like Samuel that I mentioned who reject some of those cultural practices. And he doesn't, um, and it's not just about rejecting some of the Yiddish influences, he also doesn't like certain practices like um, he doesn't like to wear a black hat, he wears a black velvet kippah, but he has a, a, a band of blue trim around it. He, he doesn't want to fit in exactly to the culture of the community, right? And for him, he was kind of unhappy with my research project. He kept telling me, you shouldn't, you shouldn't focus on this. You should focus on what's inside, and you should focus. That's the important thing, is how, what kind of a person you are and, and how you follow the system of morality. It doesn't matter if you, if you pick up Yiddish words. Um, so he represents a um, one school of thought. Um, and your other question was about uh, couples that have different rates of acculturation. Um, and I did find a few couples like that. Um, and I have heard of cases where that kind of thing ends in divorce, but I've heard of many other cases where it ends happily. And um, actually, one of my uh, master's students at Hebrew Union College School of Jewish Nonprofit Management, where I teach, wrote her master's thesis on Jews who have different levels of observance and are married to each other and, and how they make it work. 
Um, and so, and she, she interviewed a number of couples like that, um, where one was becoming more religious than the other, or one grew up orthodox and the other one did not, and they maintained their separate levels of, of, um, of religiosity, but at the same time they had to make accommodations and, and compromises, especially when it came to the children. Um, but for the most part, in couples that I encountered like that, they generally accommodated to the more observant partner because um, otherwise that partner wouldn't feel comfortable. It's more complicated than that, but that's the short story. Other questions? Yes, Professor Modan, a professor from Ohio State University. Okay, so the first question is about gender access. Now, I was worried when I started this research that I wouldn't be able to access the men in the community, and certainly that was the case for some things. They wouldn't let me into the yeshiva. I could only look through the window and see a sea of black and white, both their outfits and the pages that they were reading. Um, but um, I was somehow uh, granted access to a few chavrusas, and um, this help me to, um, to, to come up with the analysis that's part of one chapter where I look at a number of different men um, of different stages of integration and those who grew up Orthodox. And so I actually recorded one man in a learning session with another FFB, he's FFB, with another FFB and with a BT and to look at how he spoke differently to those different people. And that was great. And, um, and I, now I know that my presence may have influenced the way that people talk and I discuss this a, a lot in my chapter about methodology, how people um, always change the way that they spoke when they were speaking to me and sometimes they change the way that they spoke when they were speaking in my presence. I even ha um, observed this once when <clears throat> I was in a um, classroom in a study that preceded this one and I um, left the tape recorder on and went to another room to observe something else and came back and I noticed when I listened to the tape later that the teacher of the class used more Hebrew words when I wasn't there, um, which was really interesting. Um, so, but I um, actually sometimes had more negative feedback from women than from men. Um, whereas, so some women that I had been recording and interviewing, um, one of them said that uh, she doesn't want to be my research subject anymore, she just wants to be my friend. So I said, okay, fine. Um, and um, another, another one said um, that she asked her rabbi if um, she could be part of the study. This was after I had been recording and interviewing her for quite a while. And she said that her rabbi asked, um, where is she, meaning like, is she from? And she said, she's on the derech which I had never expressed to her that meaning like on the road to becoming from. And so because I was not yet from, he wouldn't let me, uh, he wouldn't let her be part of the study. So she said that she didn't want to be part of the study anymore. Um, the next day she asked me to give her a ride somewhere and I said, I don't think it's a good idea because then I would be observing you and you don't want to be part of the study. And she said, it's okay, it's just, I'm just going to a um, non-Jewish um, tailor for my wedding dress. And I said, okay, as long as you're okay with me listening to you and I won't record anything. But, and she said it was okay and I got a great datum there. Um, <laughs> actually, I'll tell you the datum because it was a good one. Um, it was, um, she, she said to the non-Jewish tailor in preparation for her wedding dress, um, she said, uh, just don't take off too much because it has to be okay for another kala, for another bride. So she had replaced the word bride in her mind with kala the Hebrew and Yiddish word for bride, and she continued to say that um, even in the presence of a non-Jew and then corrected herself. Um, so in that case, I, um, I, I had very little negative uh, reaction from men 
Um, most of the men that I that I record, maybe it was that I was recording them a little bit less in more in less intimate settings, just, you know, more in um, interview settings and in um, this text study session. To answer your second question, um, hyper accommodation, I see it as um, I see I see them as sort of synonyms. Um, but I prefer the term hyper-accommodation over hyper-correction, which is another term used in sociolinguistics for um, trying to say something and then kind of overshooting the norm, because it's not necessarily a matter of correct or not. Um, and um, in some research on hyper-correction, um, another, another term is hypo-correction, where um, African Americans who are trying to speak African American vernacular English but didn't grow up with it overshoot the norm or, or because there is the sense that it's stigmatized, it undershoots the norm or, um, or hypo correct. And I don't like that term because um, it's like the sense of a hierarchy. Um, and so I prefer the term hyper accommodation as an umbrella term for all of that. Okay, yes. What accommodations did I make? Um, well, I dressed, I wore a skirt and um, long sleeves, and I covered, as a married woman, I covered my hair only when I went to the Milldale part of the community, not the Nairtamid part of the community. Um, I certainly changed the way I speak in the community, so I absolutely used the language of the community, which made people feel more comfortable and more willing to, uh, to use that language around me. So do we have time for, okay, uh, yes? Okay, second generation Balechuva. Now it may sound like uh, an oxymoron because someone is a Balechuva because they themselves become religious, but it's not an oxymoron in that, <laughs> excuse me, in that people in the community um, discuss second generation Balai Chuva, meaning the children of Balai Chuva, as having a somewhat different status than the children of FFBs. In the community where I did my research, I did not find that distinction, but I found people talking about that in other communities, and I found a number of discussions on blogs about that, about how there is still discrimination against the children of Balai Chuva for a few reasons. One is the reason of yichis, or lineage, that they are descended from people who did not follow the laws of family purity, and therefore they themselves are somewhat impure. Um, and also, um, a sense that they will have, and they will have relatives who are not orthodox and may have a negative influence on them. And I heard um, of discrimination in terms of marriages, um, in terms of um, people not willing to set up the children of Balei Tshuva with the children of FFBs. I heard it in terms of admission to yeshivas, um, institutions of higher learning. Um, and, um, but for the most part, I heard people saying, that's discrimination in other communities. We don't have that here. Okay, maybe one more question. Yes, in the back. Okay, what factors influence people choosing one path of language accommodation versus another? Good question. Um, some, well, first I want to mention skill. Um, people who have particularly good language facility were better at picking up the language. Um, I, I had one woman uh, in the study who had a master's in, um, in English as a second language or something like that, and she was one of the most skillful acquirers of this way of speaking. She also was one of the highest scorers on an experiment that I did about speech where I played speech samples and she was most aware of these things because she was particularly good at language and trained. Um, so that's one, one element of it. But that same woman was also adamantly opposed to the use of by. 
saying, staying by them. And she was also um, strongly opposed to Ashkenazi pronunciation, although she did herself use Ashkenazi pronunciation in certain words. Um, so elements of it are language skill and desire to integrate into the community, desire to maintain a sense of distinctiveness. Um, some people who did not pick up certain distinctive ways of pronouncing things and um, were very proud of their Balchuva identity. In fact, one um, man said that he wanted to start a magazine for Balei Chuva. Maybe now he'd change that plan to a website um, and, or a blog or something like that. But he was, was so proud of his Balchuva identity, he told everybody that he was Balchuva. I found other people who wanted to pass as FFB and some who did. There were some who interviewed with me and said, don't tell anybody that I'm a Balchuva because they all think I'm FFB. Um, so I did find some people like that. I also found some people who managed to pass as FFB but were uncomfortable with that fact. So like one woman described a situation where she was with a number of FFB women and they all assumed that she was FFB and they were saying bad things about Balei Chuva and, and she felt uncomfortable but she didn't say anything um, and then later she regretted not saying anything. So, so you do have these kind of conflicting emotions but you also have different um, types of people who are more and less proud of their non-Orthodox past. Okay, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.